Okay, uh, today uh, we're going to do something that I call uh, the George Washington uh, Leadership Lecture. And this is a lecture I do every year uh, at about this time uh, as we're getting to the Constitution or, or the, the first um, administration uh, of George Washington uh, in the 1790s. Um, and I like to do this because it allows me to talk about things that I think are important uh, to the founding of our country and to students that don't necessarily fall in like the political history, domestic policy, foreign policy discussion. So, um, you know, I think our next lecture is going to be on the Constitution itself and some of the debates around that. Um, then we'll have some, some, some lectures about like foreign policy in the 1790s. Th this lecture is more abstract. Um, but I also feel like it's one I do a lot because students that I have generally like this because a lot of my AP students aspire to leadership and they like to, to discuss those traits. So um, essentially what this lecture is, is four traits of good leadership seen in George Washington. You know, George Washington is obviously one of our most famous presidents. He's our first president. Uh, he is often re referred to as the father of our country. He uh, was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Um, you know, he led the Continental Army through the um, through the Revolutionary War in the 1770s and 80s. He then led uh, our country through kind of the constitutional crisis of the critical period at the end of the Articles of Confederation and helped to, to, to lay down the policies that would become our Constitution. And then, of course, he became our first president uh, and led through those early years um, in the 1790s. So, um, you know, cert, you know, very important person people have a lot of interest in and i think there's some things we can take away from him in terms of leadership so i've got four things uh the first thing that i think you see that's good leadership in george washington is that power did not consume him um, one of the the themes in, in washington's uh tenure is that he he consistently laid down power after an event was over, um, after the Revolutionary War. He says, I want to go back home. I just want to, to run my plantation. I want to farm. He lays down that power. He is then summoned uh, and called back out of retirement to the Constitutional Convention. And of course, when he, when he comes to the Constitutional Convention, who's going to be the presiding officer? It's going to be him uh, by demand, by, you know, he's the guy who has the respect. Um, he doesn't necessarily position himself to uh, campaign for the first presidency. Um, this is just something that in general, politicians in that time didn't do, um, campaigning. Anybody who, who really... Uh, campaigned for, for a position or campaigned for power, they were referred to as an intriguer, um, as somebody who was kind of sneaky or, or greedy. So um, Washington probably demonstrates the best, this idea of being ambitious, but yet always making power seek him out as opposed to him appearing to seek power. Um, you know, another example, uh, his second term, or the fact that at the end of his second term, he chooses to not run uh, for a third term, and he sets that precedent of a two-term lim limit. We have only ever had um, one president that was unanimously elected by the Electoral College, and that was George Washington, and he did it twice. Both his first term and second term, he was a unanimous election by the Electoral College, um, and yet if you read his letters, if you listen to, to him talk, he was always saying, I'm not up to this task. I need to step away. Um, you know, th there, there are better people for this. And so that kind of idea that he was not consumed by power, I think is a good trait of, of leadership. And also remember that how weird this was for that time. You know, this is the age of absolutism. Who else would have defeated or, or led uh, the def the defeat of the British Empire and then not declared themselves a monarch themselves or a dictator or an emperor or something like that. Uh, in the age of absolutism, uh, Washington was a good leader because power did not consume him. Uh, a second trait of good leadership is 
you don't have to be the smartest person in the room in order to be the best leader. And, and I think you can also flip this. Uh, the smartest person in the room is sometimes not the best leader. Um, so, you know, if, if I've got an audience here of a bunch of AP students, my guess is you guys are all pretty bright and you you probably want to or aspire to be in leadership positions in some way, shape or form. And I think we can we can learn from this. We The smartest person is not always the best leader, but you don't have to be the smartest person um, to be a good leader. Um, all the other founding fathers, and I say all, there's probably exceptions, but a lot of them went to Ivy League co colleges. John Adams went to Harvard, Alexander Hamilton to Columbia. You know, guys like Thomas Jefferson, we probably wouldn't call this Ivy League, but he went to William and Mary um, and studied under, um, you know, really successful lawyers um, uh, of the time. Washington, however, does not have any of that high education. And I think um, as a leader, that kind of put a chip on his shoulder. Um, and, you know, I put on here, he was anxious. Um, um, you know, I think he always felt nervous about his words, especially his writing and his speeches, because he did not have that eloquence or that formal education that uh, a lot of the other people uh, that he worked with had. However, despite his anxieties, he wasn't intimidated and he was comfortable enough to surround himself with good people. So, um, you know, during the, the, the revolution, you know, he brings a guy like Hamilton in to be, um, you know, his like chief of staff or whatever, to, to kind of be his aide de camp. Um, when he eventually becomes president, he creates this, this system of a cabinet, you know, a secretary of the treasury, a secretary of state, a secretary of war. And he, he picks bright minds to come in um, and, and he knows that he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't necessarily have all the knowledge, and so he's going to surround himself with a good talent base. Um, this kind of rolls right into um, uh, the third point, that only a fool likes the sound of his own voice. What that means is, is that as George Washington sought out bright and talented people, the best and the brightest, to come in and help him lead, um, he, it would have been tempting to just say, where are the people that agree with me? You know, if, I, if he has a vision for where the country's going to go, let me bring in the people that are going to move the country towards my vision. But realizing I'm not the smartest person in the room, um, I need good people. He is willing to bring in people from different opinions. Um, so, for example, you know, we'll, we'll learn more about this as we read. But Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are, are you know, very much on the opposite ends of uh, of the spectrum when it comes to the vision of where America should go. Um, Washington was very good at, at bringing in. Um, both of these viewpoints, um, and he would listen to both. Um, he encouraged debate within the cabinet, and he knew how to get the best ideas out of different points of view. And then here's the thing. Um, he didn't just choose a middle path. He, he didn't just say, well, we're going to take a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Once he heard the arguments and once he was presented with the ideas, he was decisive. And so he didn't necessarily have to be the smartest person, but he did have to be decisive. And so he would, he would encourage the debate, he would get the ideas, and then he would make the decision. He would take a side. Um, and when you do that, you're gonna ruffle feathers. And this was the other thing Washington was great at, is he was really good at soothing egos about, you know, over and over again in the cabinet debates, Washington is going to decide to go with Hamilton's ideas. And, and Thomas Jefferson, you can see this in letters, he's constantly writing, George Washington letters saying, you know, you're not listening to me or I'm not valued or um, I'm going to resign because I'm not getting my way. And, and Washington was always way, able to go back to him and say, no, you are important. I, you know, you are a fellow Virginian. You, we need you. You're the only person with this experience. And he would soothe that ego in order to keep the best and brightest uh, around him. Only a fool likes the sound of his own voice. Um, a good leader doesn't just surround themselves with yes men. Um, they, they, they encourage that debate and they take in uh, multiple points of view. Um, the final thing that I think that we can take away from George Washington as it relates to, to, to leadership is he does a good balance of 
leading by getting out in front. He is going to be ahead and above the people. He is going to be better than. But at the same time, he is able to come alongside uh, and link arms and encourage and be one of the people. Um, a good leader has to be able to play those balances. Um, if you are only out in front and above and better than, you're going to come across as stuck up and arrogant and out of touch, and people aren't going to listen to you. However, if you're only alongside and just one of, you're not going to be able to distinguish your ideas or really gain the respect needed to get people to follow you when you want to go in a certain direction. George Washington had both of those traits, um, the ability to separate himself um, and to lead, but also to come alongside. A couple of examples there. Uh, and these, again, these are precedents that that George Washington set as the first president of the United States. He didn't shake hands. You know, when, when people would come in, and of course nobody shakes hands now because of COVID-19, but you know, that was a very, um, you know, common everyday. People did this in the marketplace. This was a sign of respect, but George Washington did not shake hands. He, he said that was like, you don't go up and shake the hand of, of King George the third. You're not going to come up to the president and just shake his hand. Um, he went on visits around the 13 states, uh, and that was something he did that we could talk about in coming alongside. Washington really wanted to visit all the common people and, and to visit all the states in the Union. But when he would go into big cities, one of the things he would do is he would stop outside the city and, and put on his formal clothing, maybe uh, his military regalia or, or something else more presidential, formal. And then he would ride into the city on his white horse or in his fancy carriage so that when he came into the city, people would know the president has arrived. He is distancing, distancing himself. He's separating. He's setting himself above. However, at the same time, as presidents go, uh, George Washington is also a, a fairly humble president. Um, that this idea of this nationwide tour is this idea of I'm going to get out and be among the people. In fact, just the title, uh, when we address our president today, we say the phrase Mr. President. Uh, that's a very, you know, kind of down to earth type title. It wasn't His Excellency, the Majesty, the one and only. It was Mr. President. Um, and so that balance of elitism and humility, I think, is, um, is a good trait that a good leader will understand the importance of both of those values and learn how to manage them well. Okay. Uh, again, this is just my chance to talk about uh, a lot of these kind of off the beaten path topics uh, of, of George Washington's precedents uh, and the things that he did as a uh, you know, the father of our country. Uh, I hope that's good for you uh, in terms of thinking about leadership and, and aspiring to be a leader and uh, what traits uh, that you might learn and, and take with you. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Wow.